Okay, so um, yes, so um, at tw as I mentioned at 12, we have um, Alan Deidun, who is um, one of the first Horizon Europe Mission Board members. So um, in the mission areas, healthy oceans, seas, coastal and inland waters, which is very relevant for Malta. So really excited about uh, this new initiative, with this new funding program. So yes, um, in just three minutes, we will start with uh, Alan's presentation. Thank you. So hi, Alan. So thank you for joining. <laughs> So I've already introduced you. I took the liberty to do so. Um, uh, yes, so yeah, uh, over the floor to you. Uh, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, so it should be this one. Yes, so let me go to the first slide. Okay. Let me go to presentation mode. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, very good. So uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity, basically. I'm sorry I couldn't join earlier, but I've just <laughs> come from abroad yesterday. And, and as you can imagine, there's quite a lot to catch up with. Um, and yes, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to actually showcase the work uh, of the mission board, what we call the mission board. Uh, so when I say the mission board, it's one of the five mission boards out there. Um, specifically, I'm going to speak about the healthy oceans, seas, coastal and inland waters one. Uh, since, um, you know, as you might know, um, the EU is adopting this new approach when it comes to Horizon Europe uh, through these five mission boards, uh, which are, uh, you know, uh, addressing uh, these five priorities, thematics uh, for the EU. Uh, one of them is the ocean, then there is cancer, there is uh, urban mobility, uh, there's climate change, and there's food production and agriculture. So, you know, uh, I would say really uh, overarching, you know, cross-cutting cross -cutting issues. But it's, it's um, I would say, uh, refreshing to see that the ocean actually made it, you know, uh, to the top table for once. Uh, rather than being, you know, a sort of backbencher for so for so long, it's now, you know, um, being given the, the priority that that it deserves. Um, so let me give you a, a, a short overview of what the mission board does, what it's composed of, what its goals are, and so on and so forth. Since obviously the the uh, advice, the recommendations being given by the mission board is feeding in all these Horizon Europe uh, programs and funding calls, which are coming out. Uh, and which will come out in the next few months. So I think this, uh, the work of the mission board is very relevant for an event like this one being organized by, by the university. Um, so basically the mission board is a pool uh, of, of experts. It's an independent body. There's a, a pool of experts, uh, 15 experts. There was a call, a public call across the EU way back in April, 2019. Um, whereby people could ap uh, apply and basically close to uh, 1000 applications were received for each for each mission board you know um, and and the composition is a very balanced one and uh, in fact on the mission board and here you can see a photo uh, taken I believe this was in September 2019 so just before you know the COVID pandemic uh, basically constrained uh, constrained us all indoors, basically. Um, and, and there's a, a mixture of marine scientists, economists, policymakers, including former MEPs, members of European Parliament, private and public consultants, uh, representatives of ENGOs, and even marine stakeholders, um, for example, from the fishing, from the fishing industry. Um, and there are, there, there are regular board meetings, roughly uh, on a monthly basis. Initially, we were obviously holding these physically um, whilst COVID allowed us. Um, and we always sought high profile events to, uh, you know, to latch on to, like this one, which is the Paris Peace Forum. Incidentally, the uh, chair of the Ocean Mission Board is Pascal Lamy, who obviously needs no introduction who is the former CEO of the World Trade Organization who is seen here uh, to the extreme left of the photo and these are some basically of the of the high profile 
uh, meetings, uh, you know, that we participated in as a as a as a mission board. Um, besides the high profile uh, meetings, we also have regular liaison with the assembly. What is the assembly? The assembly is a body of is a is a um, a body made up of experts, you know, additional body made up of experts uh, from across the EU, which advises the mission board. So whenever the mission board feels that it needs uh, extra uh, advice, you know, on particular thematics, it advi it, it um, consults the assembly. Okay, um, and even we we had regular meetings with member state representatives. Um, you know, uh, at the commission, at the commission itself. So it's obviously to keep member states uh, abreast of what we are recommending, since obviously it's the member states who need to uh, finance uh, our recommendations. You know, uh, regular liaison with other missions, the other four um, missions that I spoke about, regular liaison with relevant lobbies like IOC, UNESCO, since obviously there's the um, UNESCO. Uh, ocean sciences decade at the moment, ocean energy Europe, business first, and so on. Regular liaison with youth through the European EU Parliament and with NGOs, you know, like the, uh, these large NGOs like WWF, Greenpeace, Ocean United, and so on and so forth. And basically, we decided to name the Ocean Mission Board Mission Starfish 2030. 2030 because most of our targets, or a good chunk of them, refer have 2030 as a as a benchmark. Um, and starfish is something which is, you know, easily and identifiable, um, you know, um, object, um, you know, image, uh, concept that people can relate to. Um, and I'm happy that of, of this, you know, that the starfish was chosen and actually a Mediterranean species was chosen, as you can see here in the photo. Um, and the starfish was also chosen, is chosen because it is a modular organism, I, it has arms. Um, which which uh, can regrow if they are damaged, you know, uh, and and you could have additional arms. So not all starfish come with five arms. So we could add, remove, you know, objectives, uh, targets as we please as we go along, because that is the secret, obviously, uh, the cornerstone of adaptive management. You know, but if we had to, if we have to summarize in one sentence, what the objective is, is to know, protect, and restore our ocean and waters. And initially, we're going to start with five arms, five objectives, uh, you know, each arm of the each arm of the starfish, and we're going to see these uh, in detail, okay? Um, so the five arms of the starfish, um, of the starfish metaphor are zero pollution, regeneration of habitats, decarbonization, knowledge and ocean literate society, so as to fill the, the remaining uh, a knowledge gap, but also what we call emotional deficit, i.e. that people feel detached from the ocean, from the sea. This might not be an issue Malta, since we are obviously a, a, a maritime republic, an archipelago, most of us have some form of relationship with the, with, of connection with the sea. But in some countries, especially uh, landlocked ones, you know, uh, they, there might be this, um, and there is this emotional deficit. And governance. So, you know, governance is very important, obviously, in terms of policies, the right policies, and also on the international um, stage. You know, so these are the five, the five, uh, the five arms we're starting uh, with. So, why should the EU care about the oceans? It's about the ocean, obviously, because we speak about one ocean here, because of the connectivity. Um, and what my, the the EU is essentially an ocean and seas union. Uh, with a very long coastline, um, which extends for over 55,000 kilometers, which is longer than that of the USA and on the Russia combined, you know, and it has an, a, the largest exclusive economic zone in the world, at least until Britain was part of the EU, but probably with France uh, still in, it might still be the first in the world in terms of exclusive economic zone. Uh, there's a lot of European rivers with a large catchment area. Together, the, uh, the catchment area exceeds 10,000 square kilometers. And most Europeans live in close proximity to the coast. So, um, in fact, uh, around oh, uh, over 40% of the EU population lives in coastal areas. And, and if you see, Europe was responsible for, you know, in, during the age of uh, exploration, of navigation, 
uh, for major maritime, you know, uh, expeditions and 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 uh, discoveries and so on and so forth. So we're the continent of of shipbuilders and so on and so forth. So there is this there is this intricate association uh, affiliation with the coast, and this is a map showing the different the extent of uh, the different EEZs, exclusive economic zones. Um, including those of European overseas territories, including the ones held by uh, Britain and France, and obviously Britain. Now, this this needs to be uh, reassessed um, because of Brexit, but still France has, a, has substantial overseas territories which come along with a large EEZ. Okay. And when we are obviously doing our deliberations, we took stock of uh, the prevailing ocean governance framework, um, for example, the SDGs, and the links between the various SDGs, how these are feed in SDG 14, which is the ocean SDG. Uh, and in fact, we've, we've plotted, you know, the various, imp the various uh, connections between the SDGs and their relevance to SDG 14, okay? And halfway, um, or even before that, uh, COVID broke out and we, you know, we had to pause, you know, quite abruptly in our work, at least temporarily and focus on COVID and assist the commission um, to come up with uh, ways through which the ocean could assist uh, in the post-COVID economic recovery of the EU. So we were actually tasked with drafting this report um, of which I've just put up one um, one uh, uh, recommendation, okay? There were 10 concrete recommendations in this report. This was presented in mid-May of last year to the commission. Uh, and one of them, the first one, which I've copied here, refers to uh, blue, uh, blue energy, basically, i.e. offshore, you know, energy production, offshore renewable energy production. So not offshore oil and gas. So coastal and offshore energy production program. And here we actually quantify in pounds and shillings uh, what the contribution, economic contribution of a greater investment in offshore wind power in the Canary Islands, where, you know, Canary Islands have a substantial wind resource, i.e. they are in layman's terms a windy place. Uh, you know, we quantified what this would, what this spin-off would be. So, i.e. what the what the uh, contribution in terms of employment would be, you know, the what the economic, uh, you know, what the economic uh, turn, you know, turnover would be, and so on and so forth. And uh, then, in two months later, in July 2020, um, the Mission Board delivered its um, scoping report, we call it. So, what our vision is by 2030. This is available for download, and I've put up here our uh, the URL. Okay, so where we go in depth in those five main targets, okay, and uh, the proposals we make in this report, you know, they are bold and inspirational. So we were basically, you know, uh, inspired by the, um, the, the moonshot, what we call the moonshot. So that photo of, you know, the, the Apollo, um, you know, rocket go, taking off for the moon mission. So literally it must be something which, which is a game changer. So the proposals are bold and inspirational, um, you know, ambitious. So and not so not no business as usual, and measurable, you know, quantifiable, um, so accessible, and so on and so forth. Yes, up the five targets, the five arms of the starfish I spoke about are here, okay, on the left hand side, and for e, and for these objectives we identify targets, a total of seventeen targets, okay. So, for example, for the zero pollution uh, objective, and we didn't want the zero pollution objective to be a zero plastic pollution one, because obviously pollution, you know, uh, does not come at the hands of plastic uh, contamination only. There are various types of, of pollution, obviously. Um, for example, for zero pollution objective, I was saying we identify four targets. For example, zero plastic litter generation, eutrophication, it's halted of European sins and water, zero spill and underwater noises regulated and reduced. Okay, so the targets are very ambitious. Then obviously we had to go on the nitty gritty because the devil is in the detail and give specific quantifiable targets. Okay, as we're going to see here, I've copied a few of these targets uh, for each arm, for each objective, for each starfish arm. So starfish arm one, zero pollution. 
there are some targets which expire by 2025, some targets which expire by 2030. Okay. So, for example, if we had to go for the 2030, um, I'm just picking at random 50% uh, reduction, you know, in the use of, of uh, loss of nutrients into the environment or reduction of use of fertilizers by at least 20% by 2030. You know, so at least now we're putting the numbers in so that this is quantifiable. Again, for starfish 2, regeneration of degraded habitats, those habitats which have been degraded. Nowadays, the science is there. There have been some very good, uh, you know, some very good, some seminal, I would say, EU-funded projects out there like MERSIS, which have shown that it's possible to actually regenerate uh, degraded marine habitats like seagrass meadows, um, like, you know, uh, cystocera belts, like uh, even repopulating certain endangered vulnerable uh, species, iconic med species like the Neptune, uh, like the Pinna Noble, sorry, the Noble Penshell, or for example, certain species of coral, like the Cushion Coral, Cladogra, and so on and so forth. So some muscle beds. You know? So the science is, is catching up and is there. Um, so these are the targets by 2025, 2030 for Starfish Arm, uh, Arm 2. These are for Starfish Arm 3, which is the decarbonizing our waters, ocean and seas. Okay, so basically here, uh, trying to reduce how much CO2 goes into the waters, you know, uh, through climate, through, through greenhouse emissions, for example, through shipping. So uh, for green shipping, pushing green shipping and pushing blue tourism, you know, reducing the environmental footprint of fishes, fisheries and aquaculture and making an increased use of renewables at sea. Four would be bridging the knowledge gap. So a transparent ocean that is fully known, predicted, understood, mapped, sequenced, appreciated, and well-funded. Okay. So the digital twin, what we call the digital twin, you know all about this. Okay. So keep supporting, obviously, things like Copernicus, you know, uh, and all the monitoring and innovative monitoring out there. The EU is obviously a leader in data, a world leader in data collection, uh, you know, for, for the sea to the Copernicus service. Uh, keep, you know, and keep mapping, keep funding the global ocean mapping, um, you know, exercise since, uh, you know, I, I think I've repeated this many times, but we know much more about the surface of the moon and about the surface of Mars than we know about uh, our, our, our seabed, you know. Um, and Starfish Arm 55, which is international ocean governance, European and international ocean governance. So support the BBNJ treaty about the high seas, you know, uh, push for a ban on IUU fishing, which is at the moment a hot topic at the IMO, you know, uh, and at FAO, um, and, and basically having and, and considering establishing an agency, as we have a space agency, ESA, we should also have a European Ocean and Water Agency. Okay, this is still on the table. Um, there are pros and anti and then dissenting voices about this. So. It's still obviously to be decided, and um, from this from this scoping report, okay, which is a a voluminous report, we um, extracted uh, summaries. We we'll call them citizen si summaries in all the twenty three EU official languages, including Maltese, okay, um, and we uploaded these as well. They are on the EU Commission. Uh, website. This is, in fact, the excerpt from the Maltese version. Okay, um, but through the EU Commission um, website dedicated to the Ocean Mission Board, you can download in your respective uh, EU language. You know these citizen sign, uh, these citizen summaries. Besides the full report. Okay, and this is the mission intervention logic, the latest one. Okay, so the overall objective is to restore our ocean waters by 2030, as I said. Now, from the five arms of the starfish, we seem to have consolidated them into three. Okay, so protect and restore marine and freshwater ecosystems and biodiversity. So the protection and the restoration. Prevent and eliminate pollution. And the focus on the blue economy. Okay, and, to, and circular economy and carbon neutral economy. So I would say these are three pillars now. Okay, to achieve these specific objectives, there will be a number of what we call lighthouses uh, there should be one focusing on the danube river basin 
remember this is mission board is not only about the ocean and the sea but also about inland waters we have a number of eu countries which are either landlocked hungary czech republic slovakia or which um you know uh, they 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 um they uh, prize a lot they value a lot fresh water like finland even though finland for example has a coastline on the baltic a baltic coast you know it it has a huge number of lakes and fresh water and fresh water resource is very important so you know one lighthouse will be dedicated to the Danube river basin for example there will be also a lighthouse focusing on the arctic coast and the atlantic one in the mediterranean and one in the baltic and the north sea besides a european wide blue parks conservation actions focusing on marine protected areas okay and for these there will be cross cutting enablers like the digital twin okay and public mobilization and engagement so there will be and there has already been and there will still be a lot of a citizen engagement and stakeholder engagement okay and the impact should be these these are some of the impacts we are hoping for for example 25000 kilometers of restored free flowing rivers ie where dams will be removed the eu will now this sounds a bit how shall i say ironic that we're now the eu is considering funding the damming of rivers okay to allow you know better circulation uh, in 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 catchment areas you know uh, and so on and so forth and even downstream because you cannot have healthy ocean a healthy ocean healthy seas if you don't have obviously healthy rivers uh, further upstream okay uh, to reach 30% of the eu seas uh, which are protected with mpas by 2030 you know that there is this target uh, 30 by 30 you know and the eu uh, is aiming to achieve that across the continent reduction in plastics reduction in nutrient losses reduction in greenhouse emissions by the blue economy you know and so on and so on, and sustainable aquaculture so and this this is still draft the slide uh, you know is comes from the implementation plan that the mission board has formulated and which is still not public um which is still hasn't been published because it hasn't yet been finalized but this is the work for the next decade that the mission board wants to push forward okay so till 2023 there should be the first implementation phase so the launch of the mission lighthouses which are basin scale so each sea should have one besides the danube besides the new basin okay testing and piloting of innovative r&d solutions the blue park citizen science campaigns digital knowledge the digital twin uh, system precursor and other enablers okay 204 to 2024 2025 mid implementation review so we should review what the the efficacy of all of this okay second implementation phase 2026 2069 and results and benchmarking in 2030 okay a lot of um, uh, the, a lot of funding has been pegged to the mission ocean board so we're speaking of uh, around 100 billion at least euros uh, to try to implement all the recommendations and proposals that the mission board is putting forward to make sure that at least some of the impacts and some of the targets we are proposing are actually achieved by 2030 so a sort of budget has been identified obviously this is still as yet to be uh, you know endorsed by the member states at the various uh, you know at the various uh, institutions of the eu of the commission okay so but but things are looking are looking good at least for the ocean mission board and i hope as well for the other for the other, for the other mission boards as well since at the end of the day the missions reflect um you know they reflect very important thematics uh, and highly contemporary thematics and challenges that our society is facing okay i'll stop here and i'm happy to take any questions that uh, you might you might have thank you Thank you so much Alan for that very detailed presentation. I really love the terminology as well that you use lighthouses, starfish it really ties up with the the marine field. Um I I do have a question actually if I may. Um uh, can you explain how do missions actually tie up with the work programs of, of Horizon Europe? Something I never really fully grasped. Okay. uh very this is a very pertinent question yes basically the 
the mission board doesn't draft the work programs, but it only so so the work of the mission board is I would say at, at a, it's quite at a high level. So we draft you know the strategies. So uh, when we say we we have drafted the implementation plan and the scoping paper or scoping plan, we basically show the direction. We say listen, we need to achieve this and this and this by 2030. You know uh, and. Uh, this might be the way of achieving them. And then people at the commission who are writing the work programs, the funding programs, would obviously take into consideration what we're writing. And in fact, the, the work programs, um, the funding programs that are coming out, and I've seen the ones, uh, you know, whose um, deadline is, for example, next September, reflect this. So they are consistent with what we are actually proposing. Uh, mm -hmm. But but as I said, you know, it, we have been tasked with the strategy, not with the nitty gritty of the work programs. The work programs have to have to reflect the various recommendations and aspects and targets uh, that we are we are putting forward. So I I expect, for example, uh, noise, underwater noise, plastic pollution, you know, the digital twin, restoration of marine ecosystems and of biodiversity, you know something on governance and i've seen a lot of calls on governance and policy making coming out or being published you know in in the pre in the pre draft forms and so on so yes all of the five farms of the starfish are are sort of moving in parallel directions in the work programs okay okay thank you so much for that it clarified a lot yes 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 um not sure if there are any other questions now is the time. If I may add, uh, Angie, um, the, the mission board's crucial crucial step will be next autumn. So mm -hmm. I would say September, October, we will have the final, uh, you know, news about whether, about how much basically of the mission board's um, activities will be funded till 2030. So, um, okay. you know, the, the mission board submitted its budgetary request, so to speak, and, and, and the commission and through the member states obviously needs to decide how much money it's going to, to allocate uh, to, to each of the mission boards. So not all mm -hmm. mission boards will get the same allocations, but by September, October, uh, we should have an idea how, of how much money will go to the sea, to the ocean, basically. Okay, okay. Very interesting, very interesting. Great. So, yes, um, are there any other questions from the audience? No? So, uh, so I'd say we can uh, stop here. So, thank you very much, Alan, for this very, very interesting presentation on, on missions.